Hey everyone, thank you for jumping on. We are probably gonna get started in just a couple of minutes, let everybody jump in here, but please um, drop questions in the chat throughout this conversation or maybe comments and uh, we'll throw them out to the panel here as we, as we get into it. And I'm gonna mute my Slack notifications. We had a, uh, a last minute substitution for uh, Gatano. So Mark Jung from Dooley is, uh, is joining the panel this morning. So yep. I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's got plenty of interesting things to say. Well, I mean, if you wanna hear about how I tortured my friend Kyle here with some hot sauce, that's, that's always a, a fun story for the state of virtual events. But... It's your favorite thing to talk about. Every time I see Mark, yep. hey, I, you yep. almost died. Mark almost killed me for those yeah. of you who are on the call. Yeah, fortunately we're still friends and uh, well, I'll let Kyle confirm or deny. Was it like, a, like one of those things where you try to eat progressively spicier sauces on camera? Uh, essentially, we um, over at Dooley when we were early days, we created like a version of hot ones for sales on uh, LinkedIn Live. And Kyle was one of our, our fun participants who had a great time. So if you want to see HD footage, it's pretty funny. Yeah, it's it's truly like the Slack messages after were our friend. <laughs> I, I still owe you that NFT, by the way. So expect that this month. <laughs> you do. I drank I drank almost an entire gallon of chocolate milk, and Ooh. not like not like store brand, like Overwise Farm brand. That that uh, I I had to go lay down. I could not move. It was it was terrible. It's actually, it's hilarious to watch, but. I'll, I'll pull up that link right now for anyone that wants a, a laugh after. Yeah, drop it in the chat. Um, cool. So everybody is jumping in here. The topic of the day is going to be events and conferences. As you might have seen from some of the LinkedIn back and forth, the reason that we wanted to have this uh, debate is because we got a couple of differing opinions here. So. Um, it was kicked off on Twitter. It was actually Gatano who said, hey, events are a waste of time. Uh, Nick chimed in and said, uh, you know, the booth is a waste of time, but there's some interesting stuff you can do around events. And then Kyle actually jumped in and said, hey, I, I disagree. Um, so figured we would get them all together to chat about it. Glad that we've got awesome turnout today. Please drop questions, comments in the chat throughout. We'll be taking uh, questions and comments later in the session, but to kick things off, I'd just like everybody to go through and introduce themselves and tell me a little bit about why you feel the way you do about events. And I'm going to start uh, with Nick. Yeah, hey everyone. So I'm Nick. I'm a director of ABM and field marketing over at Alice. Um, and so, I mean, being a field marketer, events has always been a, a part of the component and like I've done thousands of them. Um, and I've just never been a fan. It's, it's weird. You don't hear many field marketers feel that way. I'm not saying that conferences and events in general are a waste of time. I'm saying that there's other activations besides paying $100,000 for a booth that you can do. All right, Mark, what's your take? All right, well, I would call myself Gaetano White. So definitely the, uh, the slightly unpopular opinion here is I think most marketers are forced into a position where they need to justify a very specific ROI against leads or some type of pipeline metric for events when in actual fact, sometimes the experiences that you can create are so much more valuable and really like cascade down in a way where Hey, if we need to go and just like run a weed play and weed scan people or build some type of motion and have branded AirPods or whatever it is that we're giving away to book meetings, it's like, you're going to be forced to run the same cycle. So I'm a big believer of the fan that you don't need to cater to the other booths that are spending half a million dollars to build something. You can come in with a $5,000 budget, get scrappy and be the hero of the conference. And I have some really great examples from not my company, uh, but good friends who have been able to disrupt things early days that might be able to help you carve out some ROI. 
Tell, tell me, uh, tell, tell the group about one of those examples just to bring it to light. Yeah. So uh, if you don't know Saul Colt, a uh, big fan of Saul's, he is very much a polarizing person. And um, early days had a friend of mine who was at FreshBooks. So FreshBooks, cloud accounting software, you know, pretty competitive against the QuickBooks space. And rather than spending, you know, 200K in a big booth, what they would do when they would go to events is they would create these fun kind of magic moments. So best example was for those of you who are Rested Development fans, they created a real life banana stand. So they literally spent $500. They built out a banana stand. I can pull up a link and they had QR coded bananas and had a $5,000 sponsorship and walked around the booth and gave bananas away. And it, exactly, exactly. And they ran out of bananas and had to like Costco buy boxes of bananas and like QR sticker them for day to day. And even when the main speaker went on stage, they were like, hey, do you see the banana stand guys over at FreshBooks, right? Like you can't pay for that even when you're a diamond tier sponsor putting half a million dollars, right? So I'm a big believer that like creativity is the superpower for marketers and that spending more money is just like a lazy way to do it. You can still have massive ROI and be the talk of the conference if you're creative enough to break through that way. Mark, uh, when, when Gatano first posted this, like no conferences was awesome take on Twitter, uh, he said that it was an unpopular opinion. Do you think it is an unpopular opinion? I think it depends. I, I think generally speaking, most marketers, when their CEO taps them as like, hey, we're sponsoring like Dreamforce or some X thing, like go, go do it, right? There's like a small part of you that dies. But, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I think it depends on what leadership's vision is. So I've had great conferences but typically what happens is it's a great conference because of that amazing executive dinner, that networking connection you had, that right speaker that changed something in your go-to-market strategy. It wasn't, oh man, I had this amazing meeting with this company that I'm like super pumped for that demo on Tuesday and they sent me some AirPods. Sorry, no offense, Nick. I know that was like a great play at Clary and like did awesome things and like power to you. And it was, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, to each their own. Kyle, uh, you were objectively the most pro events person. Um, you're not alone in this. I think Pep uh, chimed in on Twitter and then a bunch of other people chimed in on LinkedIn and said, if, you, if you're if you anti events, then you haven't been to the right kind of events. So tell us more about your opinion and, and tell the audience who you are. I think probably your reputation precedes you, but. That's not true, but I appreciate that. What's up, Steve Watt? I see Steven here, the most lux luxurious hair in marketing. Um, uh, I'm making up so, for you, man. I know. Thank Between us, that. we have appropriate amount of hair. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So um, I serve the marketing teams of Leslie and Seismic. Uh, Seismic acquired Leslie in August. So I'm serving both teams right now. Uh, so I, I think the only thing that makes us relevant as marketers is the experience a customer prospect has with our brand. And the only way to do that appropriately and effectively is highly, highly engaged experiences through events, in my opinion. Uh, so that could be virtual. I think what we've experienced as Leslie over the past now almost two years, which is crazy to say, is we can get highly, highly targeted with virtual and we're seeing a 90% attendance rate on our virtual events. Now those are small or, you know, you're not getting a thousand people in a virtual event, you're getting between 15 and 30, but you have so many different options of what to do in a virtual event. And guys, it's easier for people to go to virtual events, right? You don't have to drive to downtown New York. I don't, I know people in New York, you don't call it downtown. I'm sorry. That's, that's very, I'm from Indiana. Um, you don't have to drive to a large city and park and go to dinner and meet a bunch of people, you can put your kids to bed and get on Zoom and have great and still have a great experience. So I, I'm all for them. Uh, it's somebody, Nikki here in the chat said, what can you do to be creative with a virtual booth? Uh, fall conferences are getting getting canceled. She doesn't see the, the point in like putting the amount of money you would put for an in-person conference into a virtual conference. I mean, I can open it up. I, I, I think there is a, I'm all for these virtual conferences with virtual booths. I think there's so many different ways you can do it. I wouldn't even do a virtual booth, frankly. Um, I just, I, I, I appreciate 
the the software companies out there that are trying to incorporate virtual booths within their within their suite but just to accommodate i just don't get it so i i can't sorry nikki that's a terrible i'm not even answering your question i'm gonna <laughs> i'm just gonna mute yeah it's it's awesome. flip, it. flip it to your advantage right like when you're thinking about your customers and what they care about what's an experience that you can reallocate that budget for like work with the end in mind what was the end in mind for this event sponsorship to begin with what were you trying to accomplish how can you then reallocate that budget to do something different? Maybe it's like, hey, I'm going to book five helicopter sunset tours and a private, you know, let's say that you're at Clary and you're Nick and you're trying to do something that's like, hey, pipeline forecasting, don't do this in the dark, right? Maybe you book dinners in the dark and you book like a sunset helicopter tour and bring together like the CROs at that company to have an experience. And then maybe you have some type of like get together about some mornings, right? Bring on 70% prospects, 30% customers. And have like a really focused conversation around what that might be. And then side note, if you want to get better data, you know, to make your forecasting, obviously selfish plug, use Dooley. But uh, that that's the way that I would be thinking about it. And I would try to come to your C-suite with a plan saying, hey, I know we had this budgeted, but with this goal in mind, I don't think a virtual A, B, and C is going to do that. Here's what I'm proposing instead. Would you be open to us exploring this as a test, maybe with a third of the budget at first? We'll validate it and then we'll see like could we cascade that forward yeah i was gonna i was gonna chime in too like the thing is so i did at my last company we actually did aws reinvent um when it was virtual and they were still charging i think we paid one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a virtual gold sponsorship that had a virtual booth you want to know how much traffic that that virtual booth drove? We drove zero from an ROI perspective from the booth alone. Um, granted, we had other activations like that were around it. And uh, like Mark said, you know, creating experiences for people. The only good thing about virtual booths is like you don't have to like sit there and man something for like eight to 10 hours a day. Like you have your SDRs or BDRs like popping in when people want to chat. Um, but traffic's way lower than it would be in person as well. How do you do a good activation around a virtual event? I mean, I think I can kick it off. I think, I think a lot of it comes into like the, you know, driving content, paid social and driving experience of like, what do you want it to be? Like, what is that buyer's journey that you want them to experience leading up to a virtual event? And then like post event, you can't just think of like, this is the event, like the end all be all, like what does your plan look like leading up and is that as well as like post event? And then, you know, it's a mixture of channels and tactics that ultimately should hopefully drive a memorable experience for your prospects and customers that are there. Um, I mean, a big piece of it is, is, is the content um, as well as the redistribution of content, um, which I know you're like a big fan of as well. So Kyle, I, I, I see you dropping some, some thoughts about this in the chat. Yeah, I, I, so the activation of it, you know, we, we go hi, highly targeted. So we've, we've tried to stay away from massive virtual events that might be, might be big conferences in person, right? Because I think that Greg mentioned this, but they're just expensive. Like the, they're still charging the same amount for the event as in person, and it's not the same. So my, our best activation strategy is include customers, include prospects and include sales. So that's number one. Number two, which I put in here is to um, make it an experience. Like I, we, we, we do not talk about our product at any of our virtual events ever. Um, you let the customers do that for you. If you do, if you actually have a product that's worth talking about, which is a whole nother, uh, a whole nother discussion. Um, so we, we don't like have a sales engineer there like talking about Lessonly and how they can use the product. You just put, you put half customers, half prospects, give them wine, whiskey, cooking class, whatever. There's now magic. There's, there's, there's tons of stuff you can do now. It's great. Uh, and just let them converse and let them become friends and make introductions and all that stuff. It's the best way to do it. Are you running your own virtual events or are you participating in other company or third party virtual events or a mix of both? There's a, it's more hours because it's, it's targeted. Like I, I don't, I don't need, I don't need to pay a company a hundred grand to get a list of a thousand people that show up to a webinar. 
That's not an MQL team. That's not a marketing qualified lead. So, um, you know, highly targeted is just work for us because it allows to, for relationship building. Now that's not a volume play, which I think is a different conversation, but um, that's just how we use Postal. Mm -hmm. They have a virtual events marketplace basically um, that helps us kind of pick and choose. But, um, and that's a, the field marketing team does that at, at Wesley. Are they, uh, the people you invite to them, are they all prospects in the pipeline or are they dream accounts or how do you decide who to invite? All the above. You let the, the, the sales, the sales team kind of runs that. And then we, we help support the customers that need to be there. Uh, I'm going to Mark, I'm going to get you involved again in just a second, but I do want to hear what Nick dropped in the chat here about the, the five to nine events that you're running. That sounds like a cool program. Yeah, so we basically we've created like a whole hosted strategy around like it's basically like everyone knows what your nine to five job is, but like what are you passionate about outside of your your five to nine basically? And so we started all of these events like sushi and sake, um, rum tastings, floral arrangings, like Latin dance, um, like wellness classes, uh, yoga, and so basically we 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 we're actually we're actually doing one that we're creating like a b hotel and so we're sending everyone an eco-friendly box that has everything to make like a b hotel that you can put out in your garden or donate and a part of it gets donated to charity as as well and so we basically use that in a like for our top 20 accounts each rep has a top 20 list and then they have a named account list after that and then we have like our, our broad sam market um, and so we kind of withhold these events for like our, our tier one and tier two, um, as well as acceleration of deals. Cause I think that's another big piece that goes like unmissed for like using events. How do you know what kinds of events are going to appeal to what people? Yeah. I mean, we, we basically just try everything. Like we, we've got a pretty good strategy of our platform knows what people's interests are. Um, and so like we can kind of tailor specific events around that as well. Plus we sell the marketers and like being someone that has purchased software like this before, um, like you just kind of know what these types of people are into. Uh, Mark, before we all jumped on today, I had a couple of comments, including from Gatano and from Nick that events are often a waste of time and budget, but you have to do it for brand visibility. What do you think about that take? So first thing before I jump into that on the activation front, cause you know, big plus one to Kyle, which is if you're standing there, like the sea of SaaS companies hawking your product in a giant booth with big pictures of your product on that back wall and on the signage and stuff, you're going to blend in like everyone else and whatever you're trying to do with activation, if it's your Ray-Bans, whatever you're, it just, it's going to fall flat. So the biggest lesson that sort of I've taken has been to look at the best B2C. And some of my favorite examples have been mall-based guerrilla marketing. So there's this great company out in Mexico that has an app and it's a sneaker store, really high-end popular by trendy sneakers. And when you're in the mall, you have an app randomly while you're in that geofence in that mall you get a notification and it will say hey you have x seconds to get back to the store and whatever seconds left when you get back to that store the discount that you get so it starts at 100 and you would literally see people like drop their bags and go running to the store because they want 80 percent off so if they can make it there in 20 seconds they're going to get 80 percent off their 500 dollars purchase and it created a frenzy about people getting like what is going on, right? There's a reason why people pay to have, you know, folks on, I don't know, uh, whatever the, the North American equivalent is of like standing in line, right? You can pay people to stand in line and create fake buzz around your booth. But generally speaking, I would say for the activation question, are you doing something that's going to get everyone hyped up and excited and thinking about what's going on and having energy that tracks back to your brand? And my litmus test is, would I go home and tell my family, my friends, or my partner about this thing that I experienced? If it's not that good that you wouldn't be like, hey, so like I saw this really cool thing today and this company blew up a hundred foot inflatable plane and put us in it 
And then we did like a sake tasting in this, in this like inflatable plane. And there was like a DJ. It's like, you, you probably tell your, your whatever about that. Right. So coming back to the question about brand MJ, the, I'm a big believer. And, you know, if any of you have seen the marketing at Dooley early days, we've done some pretty wild things. Like I mentioned with Kyle Lacey and having hot sauce and launching music videos. And I mean, we're fortunate enough that the chain smokers join our cap table. So we're getting to work with them and doing a lot of, of cool stuff, but events are what you make of them. And I think that you don't need to come in with a $500,000 booth to do it. I think you can come up with a bronze booth like fresh books in the banana stand, but there definitely is some area of controlling the narrative that's important. Right. So when you're not present at all the key events and your competitors are, you're letting them tell the narrative. And just in virtue of you not being there, there's definitely some element of like being pop committed. But it really depends on if you're able to do that in other ways. So I'm a big believer in Kyle's point, and I'll kind of pass it on then that you need the best way to create these memorable experiences is in person. And you have the ability to like create bonds that sometimes you can't virtually. But if you can't do in person, like I said, you, send folks hot sauce and do really wild things or invite them into music videos or, or whatever is going to like create that moment of magic that they would then go tell a friend, a family, a partner, their network, whatever it might be. So what do you think, uh, what do you think causes this problem where um, we're forcing the ROI of events to be managed or, or measured in a very particular way that ends up incentivizing the wrong behaviors. I'll, I'll kick this one to Nick, because you and Gatano had some comments on this going in and you just made a comment about measuring ROI. I assume you've got a, a particular way you approach that. Yeah, it's it, it's definitely, we, we, we look at it from like a hosted perspective. We actually break it down from hosted and like third party. And so for us, we, we don't use MQLs, we use the MQA method. And so there's kind of like a few buckets that I break it down into like, okay, does this equal success? So like the first thing is growing the marketable database tied to named accounts. Um, that's one of our, our key success metrics. And you can kind of get that from some of this. And then it's like, okay, what are the number of MQAs generated from named as well as non-named? And then you've got your source pipeline and source revenue. Um, we do, for the customers that do join, we look at retention percentage and expansion win percentage within those. But I think the first couple that I mentioned are like truly what we look at to see, okay, how do we actually measure the ROI from this from a success standpoint? And like, was it good to do it again? Or basically, do we need to iterate off of that and try different versions of it? Kyle, you're, uh, you're not measuring ROI on events. Why, why not? Yeah, and I, I, I want to preface this by saying everybody's business model is different, okay? And for Lessonly, the way that we measured success for sales and marketing from an ROI perspective with the board was one CAC number, CAC LTV number, one number that covered all sales and marketing. What was brilliant about that early on is that it, it allowed my marketing team to figure out how to budget appropriately and make and invest on high-end experiences as long as we kept that one number at a certain point where the board was happy. Now, if you're running a profitable company and EBITDA is an issue, the ROI model is a little bit different, right? So we, had, we took 30% of our budget, our every quarter that included headcount and put it towards brand. So direct mail, events, and my, my uh, task for the team was, I want you to make this the most creative experience possible the best experience you possibly can. And we're not going to, we're not going to worry about ROI. We're going to worry about the experience. And that allowed creatives like designers, our brand team to not worry about whether or not they can keep the cost low. Now there was a budget. They couldn't go over the budget. Like it's not like we were free for all spent a hundred grand on 15 people at a wine tasting. Um, and you know, we wanted people to attend. So if you make a really creative thing, like if we, we designed a Lego llama that you can put together. If nobody wanted it in the direct mail, then you got a problem, right? So we, it was interesting to, um, it was interesting to see how the team responded when I talked more about the creativity of the challenge and not whether or not we're going to get a 10 to one. Now, 
that changes as you move up market, enterprise deals, longer sales cycles, pipeline contribution, right? Net bookings, like all this stuff. It changes depending on the business model. For Lessonly, it just worked for us because we had one ROI number across the go-to-market team. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever uh, just pulled out of an event or not even signed up for an event and said, I don't care if people uh, are walking around saying what happened to them and my competitors have a brand presence and I don't? I mean, we, we've definitely pulled out of like some virtual events and I mean, the, the gifting space isn't that large. So, I mean, you know who all the players are that are out there. And it's like, you know, Sendoso is usually out there at most events. And we have kind of taken a step back. And like, we are very selective from like a third party perspective on like what we do versus what we don't. But we do focus on the hosted. And uh, we don't like promote those to like, we don't really post on social about them because it's very targeted on like what that experience we want for those prospects. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, do you think that in general your own hosted events perform better than third party events or how do you look at uh, how to how to plan between those two options? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think so from from for our business, it works incredibly well, like we probably break the budget down to like. Say like 70% hosted 30% like third party for like our like event budget and our event budget is actually like very, very big. Um, and we do a lot of different pieces. And then we also, we, we sponsor communities, um, which is another whole like aspect of it and getting into like the events from like these communities like Rev Genius and like Peak and all these other ones. So another huge play there. Mark, how, how have you seen ROI on events measured at the companies you've been with? Yeah, so for me, um, you know, before I moved into SaaS, I was in a very niche space. So kind of think of management consulting and like executive coaching for big banks and like really kind of top tier financial um, institutions. So we would typically have a list of 80 companies and it was just building relationships and multi-threading with like the C-level and the decision makers and also procurement within those big banks. And that was like our niche. And that's where we built almost all of our business. So for us, ROI about events at that time was purely about, are we continuing to like create these amazing experience and like multi-thread and get people on a place where it's like, hey, we're like, what's happening with the you know, CFO at TD and right. Like those are the moments that, you know, there's ROI because when something comes up and you need a decision maker to come in and you can like, what do we just like text that person? Right. And then he can just send a message and make something happen. It's really hard for us to kind of put an ROI value on that. But the way that we looked at it was how much influence do we have within a 24 hour period with key decision makers at those named accounts? So if something were to change and procurement stepped in and said, hey, like we can't approve this thing, do we have enough people at the C-suite or at the table who within 24 hours could influence that decision? And it was more, um, that's how we started to look at event ROI. It was like, what was the executive influence we needed to help get deal signed? And it was just like a very specific measure. But I think one of the biggest things coming back to your previous point around ROI MJ is that Opportunity cost is one of the biggest things that plagues marketers. And I think at the end of the day, CEOs and leadership not getting marketing and thinking that two things. One, you can be at every event, you can be all things to all people, and that everything needs to generate leads just incentivizes the wrong behavior. And oftentimes, if you're investing a ton of money and effort into an event that's virtual, that, you know, you're doing it as a table stake to show up because your competitors are there, but then you have five people in your team who are not working on a creative demand gen project or something else, when you're not working with the end in mind of what you're trying to achieve, like that's going to be the death knell. And I think it's still the biggest thing that I hear frustration when I talk to marketers is just like opportunity cost needs to be more talked about rather than, oh, it's fine, like you'll just do this and that. It's like, it's not how that works. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I think Matt Chanella in one of the comments uh, coming into this on Nick's post said like it takes so much time to build a booth and there's so many moving pieces that you have to manage that like that's one of the biggest arguments against the booth route is like whoever's planning the event doesn't have time to be creative because they're just trying to, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's. Nick, is that is that what you've seen in your experience? Is that part of your argument against booths? Yeah, I, I think that I one, I think that they like you could be spending one hundred thousand dollars to be next to the bathroom. Like it's just it, it's like take say for example, you go to Dreamforce every single year. You're going to the same conference year over year. At some point, the the net new contacts that you'll be getting and the opportunities will decrease year over year because it's not like more people are going to the event. You just got to be more creative to get to the other people that haven't come by your booth like year over year. It's like, how do you reach, say there's 30,000 people there. How do you, and you get, I don't know, say 400 people that come by your booth over a, a week or whatever. How do you get access to all like those other people through different activations that aren't going to make their way to the bathroom and walk by your booth? And like, that's why, that's another reason why I haven't been a big fan of it. Um, and then it's just like, again, like you said, you can't, it's more of, you, you don't have the, always the freedom to be as creative as you want to be, because you've got to fall inside like a certain box to be able to get something done. And it's just like, you end up, everything kind of looks similar to everyone else's as well. It's like, you can't, you can stand out if you want to spend a ton of money, but it's not always worth it. Kyle, are you on this anti-booth train too? I'm on anti boring train. I don't care what you're doing. Like I, I don't, I hope there's no like booth manufacturers in here. I'm not <laughs> hating on a booth. You can make a booth awesome. You can make a booth actually work. You can make a lot of things work. Um, I, I am like Nick said, I am against looking like everyone else. And you know, I, you know, don't put a booth, buy a spot and just put a table. You think you're gonna get more people talking to you? <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be like, "What the hell are you doing? You don't have a booth. You don't have a couch I can sit on with a, with a with a champagne glass." But uh, I do want to speak to one thing that Chris asked on um, when leadership says something like, "We have to uh, we have to have a presence there because people are gonna say well, what happened to them. They're not exhibiting. They must be in trouble." Um, the way that I have navigated that in the past is uh, before I say we're not gonna do it, I have a plan on how we're gonna reach the right prospects that will probably be attending the event. And that's all they care about. In, at the end of the day, there's one thing that we all care about in high growth software, pipeline, which, could, which is revenue, right? So the org leader is saying that their only issue is, oh God, somebody's gonna think we're in trouble. They're not gonna call on us. We're not gonna get the deal. Mm -hmm. So show them how you get the deal without having the the booth presence. But again, I'm not I, I'm just against a, a, a lack of creativity. What's a what's an example of a, a way, a, an alternative you have presented like this is how we're going to get them instead? Uh, you know, we've done at Dream. I mean, somebody said Dreamforce. Dreamforce is a great example. We decided not to sponsor and just had people attend and event them and invite them to a really high end experience, a high end dinner. That's not that creative of an idea because everybody does it, but you don't have to have a booth at Dreamforce. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is just highly targeted direct mail if you know people who are attending. If your sales reps understand, hey, I have a group of people who may be going to this event, then get the addresses, do highly targeted direct mail. That's not a cup or t-shirt. Nobody needs more of those, right? Do something creative that has to do with the event and try to get them on a call. You know, tie the event in as much as possible, but you don't have to be there. Now, there's there's tons of different roadblocks to get there, but that's that's kind of the that's the approach we've taken in the past. And it's more named account, right? It's more of like that's more of an ABM approach than like, or another one is buy a billboard and a highway on the way to the event. You're going to get way more eyeballs on that billboard than you are your booth. Yeah, Just make I, the um, billboard creative. 
I've heard of a company buying the uh, the things that hook on the front of hotel room doors, the do not disturb signs, and like branding them and then hanging them in, in the hotel, which I think is probably like not legal, but uh, they did it and they got great brand, brand recognition from it. So Mark, I, I, okay. I know, oh, I'm sorry, no, Nick, I saw this, uh, the, the thing with direct mail, so many working from home. I don't know if you're gonna respond to this, but you probably should. Uh, so for us, we ask for their home address and they usually give it to us. Mm -hmm. And if you use a third party to do that, then people are more likely to give it to you because you don't have an AE asking for a home address, which is creepy. But we use a third party to do it. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna add to that too. Yeah, same, same for us. We um if we send someone something, they actually have to give us their address beforehand as well. But I wanted to, I wanted to go back to the Dreamforce thing because when I was at Clary, we actually did this at Dreamforce in 2019, and we did we didn't we didn't have a booth, we didn't sponsor the conference itself, but right next to it, we rented out seven suites at a hotel next door. We drove 200 in-person meetings with execs from companies and we also rented a bar down the street and we basically threw a party every single night we drove over 30 million dollars in pipeline from one week um from from doing that and i think we spent I'm trying to remember it was probably around probably around like fifty thousand dollars that we spent on that which I mean, look at that ROI. That is literally insane. And like, that is just something for these bigger conferences that you can do if you play it strategically, if you work together as a company and you have your AEs, SDRs, marketing, CS, whatever, working together to get the right people to these in-person meetings with your exec team to ultimately drive those conversations. Um, there is, in fact, a booth building person in 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 the event <laughs> so jay if you want to come oh on, my god I'd love to bring you on but i'm not going to force you to come on but if you want to come on just say yes in the chat and i'll bring you on i'm not shy <laughs> um, oh, <there> <laughs> jay. all right let's uh, tell us about what you're thinking about this uh this discussion i mean i, I don't disagree i think a lot of the tactics people bring to trade shows are, are trash. I mean, if you're not thinking about that experience in the attendee journey, yeah, it's a total waste of money. You know, a show like Dreamforce, there's so much noise at those shows. If you're not thinking about how you're going to drive people to your space, you're just hoping people have to go to the bathroom, like Nick said. I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. That, that, and that's been the biggest change in a lot of our industries, thinking about that overall experience. Have you heard anything that you disagreed with on this, uh, on this event so far? Uh, the trade shows are a waste of money. <laughs> uh tell tell me tell me what people should really think about trade shows um you know i think you really need to be focused there are a lot of you know they were talking about uh old practices and history it's like you know you don't have to just go to the show because you've always gone to the show it's making sure that the roi is there whatever your roi might be if you're you're making an awareness play yeah you you're going to want to be in more places but it's really just making sure that it's justified the talking to the sales reps and saying, oh, we've always gone to the show. That is the worst excuse that you can have. And you're just going to throw away money. It's, you know, it's always having that purpose. You know, Mark was talking about thinking of the end in mind. It, it has to ladder up to the overall company objectives. Otherwise, what's the point? From your perspective, how do you tell the difference between a good show to attend and a bad show not worth it to attend? Uh, it's... You can't really blanket it that way. I mean, it's, you know, you got to look at the target audience and get, you know, a lot of these association type shows are not as uh, transparent is probably the nicest way to put it with what's going on and who's actually there. Um, I think Kyle mentioned earlier, like a virtual trade show through an association over the past year and a half is a total waste of money. I mean, they're just trying to replicate what they're doing in person online. It's like you might, I think a better play would be a matchmaking type of arrangement where it's like, yeah, we want to drive people to your space, but they were forcing people into a platform that most of them were horribly run. And it was just like, oh, cool. I get to look at a 3D picture of my booth where people can't actually do anything with it. You get a little window this big to talk to people. You can't arrange anything. It was, you might as well set up your own webinar and get more use out of it that way. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, letting me put you on the spot. <laughs> um, thanks, Jay. My pleasure. Yeah, appreciate it, Jay. <laughs> Mark, I ha we haven't heard from you in a while. Has anything stuck out to you? Yeah, so I mean, um, a few things are top of mind for me. Um, Victoria was asking, you know, getting people's attention after hours. And with so many people were trying to fight for 
attention, especially in the before and after moments, because those matter a lot. How do you do that? I'm a big fan of priming. So typically, if we're doing some type of event, I think about it in three different ways. So number one, when people are arriving in this location, how can I create an amazing experience from the moment that they touch down, they're thinking about, in this case, like dually, right? So when they're getting to the airport, if I have five party buses that are out of the airport and I have a list of people and I know when they're there and they're talking about it on social or posting and I have some marketing outbound that's like, hey, when you hit the airport, if you want to ride over to this conference, like come join the dually party bus, we'll bring you there. Right. That's their first experience hitting the ground. They're not even at the event, but they're here. They're having a good time. Right. Like they're associating with our brand when they go to the event. And even if you don't get permission to do it, I'm a big believer in like forgiveness over permission, because I think that's where the best marketing comes from. Sorry to all the events I sponsor. And yes, our legal team is great. So that helps me. But if you go and stand up a hundred foot inflatable plane, right outside that event with your branding and bring people in it. Right. That's a big, interesting thing. You know, like when we had Kyle with the hot sauce, right. I was renting. <laughs> we didn't get the chance to pull the trigger. This 20 foot inflatable volcano that we were going to stand up because we were doing this hot sauce thing. And it's like, you're going to see that you're going to know it. You're going to think duly that's going to be an experience. Right. And then in the event, don't just stay in your booth. That is like the worst thing you can do. You need to have activation squads. I'm a big believer in like, just go get something like cardboard signs, wax models, like Flintstones, little cars, whatever it might be. And you set your activation team going around the booth. And if you can time something, like if you've ever been to a, a music festival, like a Coachella or something, they have like bracelets that light up. If you can give people things that you can turn on or activate to get people's attention, especially if it's during like a speaking event of a competitor to get people's focus away or something like that. You know what I mean? Like that's what you want to do. And when you prime from beginning of event to entering event to an amazing experience in that booth and then bringing people together, that's what's going to generate buzz. And if you back that into something where it's like, Hey, we're running a scavenger hunt at this event. And as long as you hashtag do and take a picture of that stuff, that's going to be showing up in people's feed right? Like you geofence that area and you're going to market to that list as well. So then anyone in that area, you're advertising to as well. And my last point was like, don't do the same thing. If everyone's trying to get people to a dinner, do something different, right? But hey, I'm going to pick you up in this helicopter, you and four CROs. We're going to fly to this island. We're going to go horseback riding and we're going to have like a campfire and talk like CRO horror stories in this, right? That's something that's unique that's going to cut through. So that's kind of my long-winded way of saying like prime, activate, have a squad, stand out and be different. And I do like do it in a way that creates a spectacle where you become larger than the event itself, because then you can turn that into the foundation for your own event going forward in the future. You know, like that's what we're worth thinking about here at, at Dewey right now. The one, one thing to know real fast, which Lori mentioned it in chat, I do think you really have to know your audience. What's interesting about this conversation is that Nick, Mark, and I have sold primarily to people who like all this stuff, marketers and salespeople, <laughs> everybody in this room, right? You got to be very, very, very conscious of your use case, right? Like, do you want a huge inflatable plane at a financial services conference? Probably not, right? I mean, it could work, but just, just keep that in mind. Like, I... I it's really easy for the three of us to talk about this because we sell to the coolest people ever, you know? So it's, it's uh, you just got to keep, not that other people aren't just throw that out. So nobody like shares that sound bite and I get roasted. Um, but just keep that in mind. You got to remember the use case. Matt, Matt you want to come on and talk about th this, the version of this that works for industrial and manufacturing companies. I know you're in there. <laughs> Oh, you can't right now. Does anybody, if anybody's on that wants to come on and Chris, talk. To Chris you. does in, in insurance. Chris All right, asks. let's go, Chris. Hey, yeah, so what was the, what was the question? Oh, about being able to do cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, do you, do you think about it differently because you don't market to the same audience that, that Kyle and Nick and Mark market to? Yeah, so I think I think in our industry, because it's a lot of uh, insurance and risk thinking people, um, there's a lot of risk averse 
thought when it comes to to events and shows and, and you know the, the question I asked earlier is all we have all these leaders who for decades have been spending 100 250,000 on a big booth because that's what we've done and um, and then that just picks up steam like like what Jay mentioned so um, you know this all this has gotten me thinking a lot about hey can we take a hundred thousand of that and try something a little bit crazy can we push push the boundary a little bit more but um like I can't remember who who mentioned it, but also, you know, we we have an events team, um, but they're busy on this hamster wheel of running from show to show to show, booth to booth to booth, and um, you know we don't have like one or two really big ones. So there there are all these different different challenges, but um, we do have to kind of be cognizant of um, are we going to be doing something that's like big and distasteful or might hurt our you know however many year old legacy brand that we've built and it's very delicate and fine and um you know I, I would love to be able to to sit up an inflatable plane with a whiskey tasting and you know we have like fire breathers outside uh but we, you know we got to find like the equivalent of that for our audience uh like like Kyle was mentioning so you know it's it's a fine line but um an interesting one to try to find yeah appreciate that perspective um people want to hear about your opinions on swag anybody got strong feelings? oh oh i have very strong feelings about swag uh what what's what was it was there a question or what you should do or what's the um man it was I, way back here i think they just said you know uh, uh, that was me oh, just that asked. there you go hi i'm justine i'm with with Greylog. I, I run our, our global events um yeah, I'm just having a hard time with virtual swag. I also just hate swag. I've been in this industry for a while and I've always just wanted to show up at like, you know, reinvent with like an empty booth. Um, Cause everybody knows those first like six hours are just like you're scanning, you're handing a t-shirt. You're like, what size, what size? That was always shot down, but I want one, I wanted to see if anybody's done that. But now that we're hybrid and virtual and we're actually planning our first uh, user conference, which is going to be virtual. And I'm trying to like, figure out do we do a direct mailer it's you know free to register so our attrition rate is going to be really really high um but what can we do that's like engaging and interactive that that people have seen that they've liked or that's worked uh justine if you want to send me a, i don't know a note with your email i can send you some examples of what we've done for our virtual awesome. events but we try we try to incorporate the direct mail into the event so like you have a bell or it's it's wine tasting or whatever like it's it's not just the lesson league gear it is the event gear right mm -hmm. so we the other thing that we did was in order to differentiate from swag that you'd be given at a conference we launched an e-commerce brand so an actual clothing line um called ali llama and co which okay. you can go buy right now any of you can, can. um and that that kind of um that set apart just handing a t-shirt that said Leslie on the front. Um, the one thing that we've done, I, I do all of it internally. I don't have an agency that builds this stuff out. Like I don't go to a swag agency and say, what should we do? Right. Uh, because they never have the best ideas. So I have our brand team build out the direct mail and we do all custom. So whether that's an Ollie Llama, that's a Lego or a board game or, or um, a golden llama, whatever is associated with our brand, we do right. it internally. Um, What's what does everybody kind of spend budget wise, like as a percentage of your total budget, or is it just case by case depending on the high touch and the visibility of the event? Uh, are you talking per event, or just overall? just over? Oh yeah, no, more on a per event, not like overall event budget for the year or something yeah i don't i can't speak i don't nick mark i can't speak to per event yeah we we kind of we don't really do it per event and we, we also don't use an agency or anything we basically we do everything ourselves we're only like a nine person marketing team um so we wear many different hats and like i do a lot of like the creative pieces for like our direct mailers and we are big obviously on like the digital gifting piece and so like we actually have our conference coming up on the 23rd this month and so we're doing some really creative direct mailers 
for, for key accounts, but we've also uh, got, we've created like themed marketplaces from a digital standpoint that we're able to kind of go on and kind of like have like a, like a swag store, um, basically of both like branded stuff, but also non-branded stuff as well that relates back to the event and the sessions that kind of go around the event. Like it's not just content around like ABM and events for our event, but like we're also bringing in like, hey, we have someone coming to do um, like wine tasting. We have someone coming to do like a floral arranging. So there'll be like a mixture of like bringing that five to nine to the actual conference too. Right. Cool. Thanks guys. So I had a, a couple of comments in chat and, and this has been on my mind for a little while. Uh, maybe we'll start with Mark. How, like how, what kind of things do you prioritize or how do you make trade-offs when you have a really small team or really small budget? Yeah, so typically, the if you're in that spot where right, you're going up against the person spending 200k on a booth, and it's like that, you know, looks like the outside of a bank, right? It's got like the industrial architecture, it's got all these things, it's got like five screens, you know, they're gonna have 30 people, you have like one person, like a bronze sponsorship, and you got to figure out like, oh, uh, how am I going to create experiences? How am I going to create a memorable moment? And like, what am I going to do here? And I think it really comes back to like, I think Kyle, Nick, and I all have the same philosophy, which is like creativity wins the day and you don't need the biggest budget, right? So like the example I gave before about like the fresh books banana stand or like something that you can do to create hyper urgency. I'm always a big believer in thinking about um, coming back. So like I'm, I'm a big fan of just linking to like the emotional and social pains people are experiencing. I think that's a big part of why, you know, even like meme language, you know, even for executive buyers, like, hits home because like it's reinforcing in a quick image, like a pain that someone is feeling. And if you can take that and link it back to an experience, right? So think about like, oh, everyone's doing t-shirts, everyone's doing swag and you're like, oh, what am I gonna do? What could I do to create an experience that maybe links back to something, right? So it's like, maybe I can have these like really small tea light candles made that have like a signature scent that it's like, you know, the, the feeling when your CEO says that you need to sponsor all the conferences, if you're selling to marketers, and then maybe you have like a $1, you know, like neck massager or something like that, or a signature, like bubble bath scent. And you like create this like named collection linked back to like the pains that people are experiencing. And you package this up as, you know, like empathy for marketers, right? And maybe it's like the jelly beans, you know, those jelly beans, like Harry Potter that have flavors that are really bad that's what it's like being a marketer sometimes you get dealt a shit jelly bean and like that could be part of your experience pack of like hey i feel that you all feel really stressed so we're gonna have like little bath time we're gonna have our little tea light candle and we're gonna eat our bag of jelly beans and one might be shitty and maybe you name that flavor right and it's like when the zero is like where are my thousand leaves right so like, that's like a really tightly off the cuff like experience you could create if you were selling to marketers right? Trying to do events. Nick, feel free to steal this. And that's something that you could do really, really scrappy. And then rather than getting, you know, other people's t-shirts, a play that I'm a big fan of is typically everyone's going to have like this giant bag of swag from other brands that they don't like is get stickers, get markers, get decals and be like, Hey, like we're going to customize the swag you got from another company. Like, let me make that cooler for you. Make that better. Right? Like that's something that you can do with other people's stuff whether or not they're happy about that is kind of unclear, but typically that's the way that I would approach it is like track back to a pain, something emotional, work back from there. And then my team and I usually have like a creative brainstorming session and think about like a low lift thing. So um, last example that I, I would give that is recent for us is um, we did a big G2 push last quarter and we ranked like top momentum leader, leader across the grid. We did all this stuff. And rather than doing like a traditional G2 push and the same thing for like an event is we filmed GQ magazine covers and we filmed a music video to like fly like a G6 and replace it with G2. And we did like a whole experience around that and push that out. It's the same kind of thing you could do for events, right? Even if you didn't create something for someone, what digital assets you could create? Could you put them on the front of a magazine cover? Could you Photoshop them next to their favorite celebrity or like whatever it might be? So that's, that's my, my, I think, slightly long take, but over to you all. I mean, uh, I can remember, so I, I don't have the, I don't have the small team now, um, but when we did, I think the biggest mistake marketers make is who they hire first when they're building out a team. 
you hire growth first because you bet you best be producing revenue or pipe if you want to do all these creative ideas because you're going to get fired if you don't growth is number one or demand whatever however you want it number two is an amazing designer you can hire everything else later but the problem is that you don't follow that create revenue create great design and you're going to have you're going to have the the potential to grow to to scale a brand and scale a culture but also scale revenue and then you build from there i um go ahead nick do you you have additional yeah. thoughts no no i was gonna say I, I totally agree with that for sure and like we kind of like it's i'll just kind of leave it with this like the way that we break it down is like okay you have to create demand build brand by educating providing insight to like your target buyers you have to know your icp your secondary icp like what are the communities that they leverage when you create and build that demand to build the brand how do you then capture that demand on your website by optimizing your messaging clear ctas offers like remarketing it all goes to events too and then you have to activate the outbound piece for sales and marketing motion name like aimed at your your target accounts plus your in-market accounts all of these three kind of like levers will also could you could use the same exact thing for building your like event strategy as well. Um, I want to ask a terribly selfish question because I am a really bad field marketer personally, much more of a demand gen product marketing person. If you're a marketing leader and field marketing is not your strength, how do you? you know, encourage the team to to make these kinds of things happen. If you don't have somebody with fantastic ideas like Mark Chung, Kyle, you seem to have thoughts. <laughs> so I'm, I, I am that, I am that person. Uh, you, so your third hire is a great field marketer. It's like, it's like baby Mark should be your third hire, right? I, you, the, the outside of that, you copy, you copy people, you copy Mark. You copy Nick, um, you copy the Lesson Lee seismic field marketing teams, right? I mean, that's the only way you can do it um, until you have the ability to hire somebody that has that creativity. Usually when you have a great designer, they can think, they can think outside of just design. Yeah, a creative person is a creative person. So I'm going to, we're run up on time, so I'm going to shut up. Mark, do you actually consider yourself a, a field marketer? No, I, like I consider zero people on our team at Dooley to be field marketers, and I am a terrible field marketer. I'm I'm like more brand demand, think of creative ideas, cut through the noise, and that just happens to translate into in. But I'm not like if I, I'm going to put that on my LinkedIn, not a field marketer. I'm like Kyle Lacey, I'm going to quote this and put this. No, uh -uh. don't box me in, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know mark like we, when we talked like a couple of weeks ago like you had some great ideas you could fit right into the crowd you're an, he's an idea guy he's an idea guy <laughs> yeah. he's a great great demand gen leader idea guy uh nick any one takeaway you would leave people with from this discussion no i mean i would just say like be creative like be don't be afraid to to try something different like it's okay if you try something that is different and it fails like at least you're trying something different and then you can course correct and go from there. But like, just, I mean, doing the same playbook everyone else is doing is, isn't going to get you as far as it did even in a year ago. All right. Well, um, let's wrap with that. I got to say, I'm a little disappointed because ultimately I think you guys agreed on a lot of stuff and I wanted to have a heated debate, but we kind of knew this was going to happen. So, um, screw thank you, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't Gaetano. I did my best. You guys got the, the C version instead. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Mark, for all your time. A lot of people had great comments in the chat about how valuable this was. So appreciate you joining us. And this will be on YouTube for anyone that wants to watch it again later. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, all. Talk soon. Bye.